I want to direct your eyes and your ears to the scriptures. I'm going to read this morning from 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 15. Listen to, the, listen to Peter's second letter to the church. But do not, do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and everything that is done in it will be disclosed. Since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, what sort of persons ought you to be in leading lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming, the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set ablaze and dissolved and the elements will melt with fire? But in accordance with his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth where righteousness is at home. Therefore, beloved, while you are waiting for these things, strive to be found by him at peace without spot or blemish, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. So also our beloved brother Paul wrote to you according to the wisdom given him. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the world. Amen. Thanks be to God. Church, what comes to mind when you hear the word, this is a fun word, apocalypse? It's the Sunday of peace, so, you know, we're going to talk about apocalyptic stuff, okay? Maybe images of the earth being destroyed. Maybe thoughts of the sun being blotted out or the moon not shining. Maybe Ben Affleck. <laughs> Wasn't he the guy in the movie? Was, was Armageddon, yeah, right? Uh, Liv Tyler, was she in that one too? I don't, I don't remember, yeah. Um, you know, I don't know, we think of like... Uh, destruction when we hear that word, don't we? Apocalypse. It's a heavy word. Well, let's have a short Greek lesson this morning. We heard from Dutch already today. Let's learn a little bit of Greek. The Greek word where we get our word apocalypse, it comes from the Greek word apocalypsis. So it's different, but not. And it means something. It's the same word in Greek and English. It doesn't mean in Greek destruction or the end or catastrophe. Apocalypse is actually a pretty common word in in what's called Koine Greek, in in common Greek. And I'm going to tell you what apocalypse means in the original language, not how we associate it now. Here's what it means. Apocalypse means to reveal. Apocalypse means to reveal. That's it. Or as it says in our reading in verse 10 today, it means to disclose, to uncover, to show that that which had been hidden. All things will be disclosed, Peter said. Apocalypse is just revealing. It means revelation. You know what the title of the last book of the Bible is in Greek? Apocalypse because it means revelation. And apocalyptic literature was was actually its own category of writing. You know how we've got different genres? You can read history, nonfiction, fiction, mystery, crime, whatever. We've got different genres of literature that people like to read. Well, in in ancient in ancient Greco-Roman world in the first century around the time of Christ, there was a genre of literature called apocalyptic. Apocalyptic literature was common, it, not just in the scriptures. There was secular apocalyptic literature. It was a genre that people would like to read. And 2 Peter 3 is a piece of our scriptures that is within this genre of apocalyptic literature. It shows up from time to time in various locations in the scriptures. And sometimes, particularly in the New Testament, the authors will all of a sudden shift gears and start talking apocalyptic literature and then go back to kind of more didactic teaching, but Revelation is an apocalyptic text. The Old Testament books of Daniel, Ezekiel, and then even parts of the Gospel of Matthew have apocalyptic literature. And today, in 2 Peter chapter 3, we have a portion of our text which is apocalyptic. We read apocalypsis not to hear about future events or 
even necessarily to read the events literally. That's not the point of apocalyptic literature. Remember, apocalypse doesn't mean destruction. It doesn't mean fortune-telling. What does it mean? To reveal. We read apocalypse, this apocalyptic literature, because it is going to reveal something to us. So when we read a, a, a chapter like 2 Peter 3, sometimes we can get hung up on phrases like, the heavens will pass away with a loud noise and the elements will be dissolved with fire. I don't know, that's kind of exciting stuff, right? We can kind of get hung up on those descriptive pieces, but if we do that, we're not really getting the point of what that apocalyptic lit is saying. You see, this is a literary device that apocalyptic authors would use in order to prove a point, not to point out the future necessarily. In fact, when we read apocalyptic literature and when we get hung up on things like the heavens are going to pass away and, and, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, we're kind of, dare I say, disobey, disobeying St. Peter? Because I want you to hear what Peter said. You know, the guy that Jesus said he would build his church upon, Peter, Petra, the rock. Catholics would call him the first pope. Because he says in verses 11 and 12, he asks a question. He says, since all, these things are to, since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in leading lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be set ablaze and dissolved and the elements will melt with fire? We got it, right? We know what he's saying. This is supposed to be one sentence in Greek, but it's, really, it's got a really complicated sentence structure. So if you give me a moment, let's break this down. I want to reword this, rework this a little bit to kind of understand what Peter's asking. So here is the NRQV, the new revised Quanstrom version. Things are going to be dissolved in this way. We are waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord. With this in mind, what type of people ought we to be? Should we be holy because the heavens will be set ablaze and dissolved and the elements will melt with fire? What he's saying is, sure, these things may happen, but do we live holy and godly lives because we fear a future coming destruction? Are we supposed to be faithful and holy and godly because we are afraid that things are going to blow up in our faces? And then in verse 13, he provides a corrective. He says, in accordance with Jesus's promise, we await new, a new heaven and a new earth. You see, he's asking a question and then he's providing his own answer for it. He's setting himself up with verses 11 and 12 saying, hey, here's a question for you. And then verse 13, he's like, he slams it down. He says this, we don't live lives of God, holiness and godliness because we fear some future destruction, but in accordance with Jesus's promise. He says, we don't live holy and godly lives because we fear some future destruction, but because we believe we have a promised future of righteousness where all things will be made new. We live holy lives not out of fear, but out of great anticipation, expectation, because that is how things will be in God's future, because that is the coming reality. So we might as well live that way now. You see, this is the point. The point is to not get hung up on the exaggerated language of apocalyptic literature or the potentially scary circumstances. That's part of the genre, the literary devices that authors would use because they did not have illustrations like we have today. It's, it would almost be like horror where things are blown way out of proportion and like mega dramatic, but they would do that in literature with word pictures not with actual illustrations. So Peter's saying, don't focus on all of that. Focus on the promises of God. The promise that all things will be made new. Okay, so whenever I preach from particularly challenging passages like this one, like 2 Peter 3, I always want to take a little bit of time teaching. So the first portion this morning is 
has been teaching. It's important that we know how to read the scriptures. So I spent time teaching this morning so that we can all be operating on the same page, laying a foundation here with, with some teaching. But now I'm going to start preaching, okay? Just want to delineate. So if you're one of those clock-watching parishioners and you like to measure my sermon length in minutes, reset your timers, okay? I was teaching. I wasn't preaching. That didn't count. I was not preaching just a moment ago. From here on out, I'm going to preach, okay? So reset right now. It is Advent. We are waiting. We are anticipating. We are preparing. It is the season where we focus on waiting. And I think all of us are waiting for something, whether it's a big thing like we just uh, anointed Martha for, or maybe it's just that Amazon package that you have two-day shipping for. What are you waiting for? Are you waiting with a lot of patience, hoping things take their time, or are you waiting with eagerness? Because, you know, the thing we are waiting for will dictate how we wait. These verses are about how we wait. If you're waiting for your holiday break from work, you may be waiting with incredibly eager anticipation. I feel like my wife said that to me this morning, that she's so excited about Christmas break. I mean, it just can't come soon enough, right? Ready to get a break from work, to go on a, a little trip maybe. Maybe if you're waiting to hear back from that job interview, you might be on pins and needles. Come on, are they going to call me back? You know, this morning I anointed, anointed Martha Ports, who's getting ready for an in vitro embryo transfer. This is a process filled with both trepidation and anticipation. It is an interesting experience to wait for this. Having experienced it before, there is just nothing like waiting to get those pregnancy tests back. And just this last week, I was notified that Ali Shikaski gave birth to their second born child. And Walker Christopher Shikaski was born on Tuesday, and I was given permission to share a picture, and he's super cute. Um, so we'll get to celebrate him in a few weeks when, when Allie and Tyler make their way back. But last Sunday, I talked with Allie, and I talked to her um, at our Friendsgiving lunch. We were sitting next to each other a couple weeks ago, and I tell you what, she was ready for this baby to arrive. If you talk to Allie while she was pregnant, she was excited to meet him. Yes, there was great like joy in looking forward to meeting Walker, but she was also just really tired of being pregnant. She was feeling really uncomfortable, and she wanted that baby out. When we think about waiting, I don't know, I think we tend to think about being impatient. How long am I going to be dealing with this situation? Could a change come sooner, please? Or something exciting is on the horizon. How long am I going to have to wait for it? Let's speed this thing up. Let's go. Like me when I'm driving anywhere in the world. I can't get there soon enough. Or if we're dealing with difficult circumstances in our present, we just want to get to the resolution of the thing. I mean, how much longer do we have to deal with this stupid situation? But then there are other times when we're waiting, when we don't want to speed time up, we want to stretch it out a bit. Now, right now, I'm finishing up my semester. I had a little bit of a scare this morning when, during the music practice, Kayla Moore, uh, I asked her when her last day of classes were, was, and she said December 22nd, two weeks from now. And I said, hold on a second. You're telling me that December 22nd is two weeks away? And she said, yeah. And I said, okay, that needs to be, I thought to myself, I thought that needs to be a lot longer than two weeks because December 22nd is when I have my paper due for my PhD class at Calvin Seminary. I have to write a rather large paper. I wrote in my manuscript this month and I learned this morning that it's in two weeks. And I'm not as far along as I should be. I'll say this, Advent and the end of a semester are a really bad mix. They don't work well together when you're in, and when you're in the pastorate. But do you know what my waiting looks like right now? 
I'm not saying, how soon can we get this thing going? I'm not saying, hey, can this happen faster? You know what I'm saying? Hold up a minute. I, I, a little bit more time would be nice. I'm not done here yet. I have a little bit more work to do. Can I have a little bit more time? And the truth is, every semester this is what happens, and every other semester I've taken an extension on my final papers. And thanks be to God that the seminary has been gracious enough to extend more time. They have been patient with me. And just this week, uh, we heard word that Reem LeClear has entered hospice care. This type of waiting is not an impatient waiting. This is a, a longing for more. You know, as, as we wait with Reen, we say things like, can we stretch time a little bit more? Can we get just a little bit more time in this moment? Anyone who's had a loved one enter hospice care knows that longing for time to slow down. I'm not done yet. There's more work that I want to be done. And so we have much more patience when we're waiting in hospice with our loved ones. You see, there are other moments where we don't say, let's speed things up, but instead we say, can we, can we pump the brakes? Can we slow things down a little bit? And when we think about the arrival of our Lord, when we think about His second coming, which is what Advent is all about, we are truly expecting a good and beautiful existence. We anticipate a time where wars will cease. I don't know about you, but I'm very much looking forward to a day when there will not be wars or rumors of wars. I'm only 36, and I'm sick and tired of wars. I honestly cannot tell you a time in my life when I've not been in a moment where that has been happening, and, it hasn't, and it's flooded my news feeds all over the place. There will be a time where cancer will be eradicated. Where children's lives won't be cut off from bombs. There is coming a day where suffering will be no more. And in the kingdom of God, we know that swords are going to be turned into plowshares. We know that tanks are going to be turned into tractors. We know that guns are going to be melted into gardening tools. You know, today we lit the candle of peace, and we know that God's future is a future of peace. So when we wait for his kingdom to come, I don't know about you, but I'm often in the first camp. Eager expectation, come on, let's go, let's speed this thing up. How long, O oh Lord, is the perennial cry in the scriptures? How long, O oh Lord, can we speed this thing up? And then we come to 2 Peter 3, and we read what he says about Jesus, and it's just like, it almost feels backwards when we read 2 Peter 3. This feels like, no, this isn't the way it's supposed to work, Jesus. See, I'm really eager for you to make things new. And Peter says, yeah, but Jesus, he's patient. He's patient. You know, in, in systematic theology, we talk about God as being omnipresent. That is omnipresent geographically, spatially, but also omnipresent in terms of time. You see, 2 Peter 3 begins by saying, time does not work for us like it does for God. For us, a day, a thousand, uh, for God, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. Cool. What does that mean? Well, this is apocalyptic literature, remember? 
And in apocalyptic literature, we don't read things literally, we read them theologically. The, the number a thousand carries theological weight in apocalyptic literature. If you read Revelation, a thousand is all over the place. And a thousand means completion. It means fullness. So when it talks about the millennium, the thousand years in the book of Revelation, it's talking about the fullness of time. So when in 2 Peter 3, we read that a thousand years is like a day and a day is like a thousand years, what we are reading is that a day is to God the fullness of time. And the fullness of time, the completion of time, is every day. You see, God is other and stands outside of our temporal existence, our, our timeline. He's beyond and above it, and we cannot comprehend it. But what we can confess is this. God does not tell time like we do in that God is, cannot, hear this, God is not in the business of predicting the future, or there are some theologians who say it's incorrect to say that God knows the future because for God, every moment of time is always the present. There is no moment in life that is not eternally present for God. A thousand years is like a day. The fullness of time is like a day, and a day is the fullness of time for God. God steps outside of our temporal existence, and for him, all things are always now. Every day is always the fullness of time for God. Peter says that the one who stands outside of our understanding of reality, who for for our, this day is the fullness of time, and the fullness of time is a day. He says that the patience of that one is salvation. Did you hear that in, in verse, verse 14 and 15 there at the end? The patience of our Lord is salvation. Now that's a line, church. There is so much in that one phrase. The patience of Jesus is our salvation. What this means is this. Jesus has time for his disciples to do the work that he has asked them to do. Jesus has time because, as this passage says, Jesus does not wish that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. As Peter says, Jesus is patient, not slow. Because Jesus is very content to wait for all people to come to repentance. Jesus is patient because he doesn't wish that any would perish. Jesus wants everyone. Hear that, church. Everyone. Does all mean all? Yeah, Jesus wants all peoples, all persons to come to a right relationship with him and with others. Jesus wants all to be saved. Jesus does not wish that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. You see, Jesus is a hopeful universalist. Jesus wants everyone to be saved. There is none that Jesus doesn't want to be a part of his kingdom. Not a one. Jesus wants every single human being to come to repentance and be a part of his people. And guess who he has given the task of sharing that good news? Can we take just one moment this morning to distinguish between good news and fear-mongering? Can we take just a moment and talk about what it means to share good news? Because sometimes I'm afraid the news that gets shared isn't always good. I said at the beginning of this message, during the teaching, teaching portion, before I started preaching, remember, I wasn't preaching back then. Let me say it again. We don't live lives of holiness and godliness because we fear some future destruction, but because we know that we have a promised future of righteousness where all things will be made new. What Peter is saying here is the good news is not potential destruction. The good news is promised 
life. We don't share the good news in a way that is based on fear and condemnation, but built upon the promise of God. You see, the good news is this. People are already beloved. You were already loved before you knew who Jesus was. You were already loved by him. You were his beloved while we were yet sinners. This is not a meritocracy here, church. Nobody earns their way into this kingdom. Grace is unfair because you don't earn it. It's given to you. You are already perceived as lovely and valuable and worthwhile by God. I'm telling you, before before sin entered this world, God said about his creation, about humanity, God said, this is good. Pastor Brian Zond has said, he has said that, um, boy, I just had a brain fart. What is the doctrine of uh, where we are all sin, where we are all sinful? Total depravity, right? Uh, Pastor Brian, Brian Zond has said that divine goodness precedes total depravity. Before we were filled with sin, God looked at humanity and said, y'all are good. I don't know about you, but I don't know many people who don't know that they've screwed up. Who doesn't know that they're a sinner? They might not use that word. But who doesn't know that they've hurt people in broken hearts? There are two people who who don't know that. Sociopaths and narcissists. I don't know many people who don't know that they're broken in some way. You see, what I think people need to hear is not that they're broken. I think people know that. I think what people need to hear is that they're beloved. Beloved. That there is an invitation, that there's a welcome, that there's a place for them. You see, Jesus said, before y'all were saved, I gave my life for you. So we don't need to listen to the lies that say we're not good enough, that we're not valued enough. Because evidently, Jesus saw us as valuable enough. Evidently, Jesus already did. So Jesus values you so much, guess what he withheld from us? Guess what portion of his life he withheld and said, you know, you can have this, but I'm going to keep this. Christ has given you his everything, his very self. There is no part of God that God withheld from us in the person of Jesus Christ. The good news is that you are beloved. The good news is that you are valued and seen and heard, not by me, not by one another, but by the God who created all things. And the good news for the poor, the brokenhearted, the overlooked, the forgotten, is that they are God's beloved. And you know what really, really stinks about all this? It's that Jesus is just too patient. He's just too patient. Jesus is willing to wait for his people to share that good news. Jesus is willing to wait. He has time for the people that he has commissioned to spread the good news to do it. He's not in a hurry. He's not in a rush. Why? Because he does not wish that any would perish. Because he wants all to come to repentance. So church... What are we waiting for? Are we waiting for anything? Are you eagerly anticipating the arrival of God's peaceable kingdom? Are you hoping for the day when all will be made right, where suffering will be no more, where wars will cease, where peace will reign supreme? Well, then maybe we ought to be a people, continue to be a people who fulfill the mission that Christ has given us making disciples of all people, sharing good news to the poor, 
from Luke chapter 4, bringing good news to the poor, bringing release for those who are in captivity, and bringing liberation for the oppressed. You know, the truth is, apparently, according to Peter, the more we share the good news, not the bad news that often falls off the lips of those who love Jesus, when we share the good news that people are beloved and can be made whole and holy, guess what? The sooner Jesus will arrive. We hasten the day, he says. We are to be those who wait for and hasten the coming of the day of God through the sharing of the good news that Jesus wants none to perish, but all to come to a right relationship with him through repentance. So what are we waiting for? Jesus is patiently waiting for you and for me to not sit on our hands, to get off our butts, to tell people just how much he loves them. What are you waiting for? Jesus' patience is salvation. And that is the good news of Jesus Christ for us today.